Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Today we are going to talk about Tanaka Hisashige, who was an inventor, a craftsman, and an artisan. And he also lived during a time that Japan went through just enormous cultural and scientific and technological changes that, like, directly affected his life and his work. So his story is about creating amazing and intricate works of engineering and craftsmanship, but it's also about witnessing and being part of just a dramatic shift in Japan as a nation and Japan's place on the world stage. Tanaka Hisashige was born on September 18, 1799, in Kurume on the island of Kyushu in the southwestern part of the Japanese archipelago. This was in the later part of the Edo period, also known as the Tokugawa period. We talked about this period in Japanese history a little earlier this year. We did the Saturday classic on Hokusai, which came out in January. For a really quick recap, though, this lasted from about 1603 to 1867, and it was a period that was known for its relatively prosperous stability. Japan had an emperor, but the nation was controlled by the Tokugawa shogunate, and its provinces were ruled by feudal lords known as the daimyo. And Japan was also pretty isolated from the rest of the world beyond Asia. Japan issued a series of edicts in the 1630s that expelled Christians and Westerners from its borders and restricted trade with other nations. It maintained trading relationships only with the Chinese and the Dutch. Japan's only international trading port was in Nagasaki. Tanaka's father was a craftsman who made accessories and ornaments from tortoise shells. And as the oldest son, Tanaka's involvement with this business and the skills and techniques that were involved with it, that would have started at an early age. But tortoise shell carving really was not what inspired him. At heart, he was really an inventor. When he was nine, Tanaka took one of his first inventions to school. It was an inkstone case with a locking drawer. Its locking mechanism involved a cord that had to be twisted in a very specific way to release the lock. At 14, he built a loom used to make a type of patterned fabric known as kurumi kasuri. As the name suggests, this is a style of cloth that's specific to the kurumi region and was developed by a 12-year-old girl named Inoue Den in about 1800. It is woven with indigo-dyed cotton thread with intricate patterns, usually in white as part of the weaving. Another source of fascination for Tanaka was karakuri puppets, or dolls. Karakuri essentially means mechanism, and it's a term that's used to describe various complicated devices. Karakuri dolls, or puppets, could also be called automata. They have a lot in common with the automata that we talked about in our previous episode called Five Historical Robots. They used things like strings, pulleys, cams, gears, gravity, air pressure, and hydraulics to move around and perform various tasks. They were both beautiful and complex, and they combined long-established traditions of puppetry and clockmaking in Japan. These contraptions were really popular during the Edo period, and there was an annual festival held for them at a shrine where Tanaka lived. He also read about and studied them through a work called The Illustrated Compendium of Clever Machines by Hosokawa Hanzo Yorinao. This had been published in 1796, and it included all kinds of illustrations, descriptions, and diagrams of things like mechanical clocks, toys, and karakuri puppets. Tanaka was building these himself by the time he was 20. Some were based on designs that other people had created, like the ones in this book, One of them was a tea-serving doll. It would carry a full cup of tea from one end of a table to another. And then after the recipient drank the tea and put the empty cup back onto the doll's tray, it would turn around and go back to where it started. This is one of the devices that was described in the Illustrated Compendium of Clever Machines. I want this Illustrated Compendium. Others of Tanaka's Karakuri dolls were from his own design. He had studied and made a replica of a Dutch air gun, and he used the same principles of air compression in some of his designs. His best-known device was the Yumihiki Dozi, or Little Archer. It's a figure on a box that has a bow with a fan-like stand of four arrows in front of it. It shoots each of the arrows at a nearby target. 
The little archer is often described as being a boy, but in Tanaka's notes, it's described as a girl. The head and the face are very lifelike, and every time it hits the target, the head moves in a way that makes it look like the archer is smiling in a pretty satisfied way. But one of the four arrows always misses, and when that happens, the head instead moves a way that it makes it seem crestfallen and defeated. To add even more to the complexity, if you remove the sides of the box that the archer sits on, you can see the gears at work inside, along with another figure that appears to be winding the lower gears to keep the whole thing moving. It's kind of a almost like cartoon physics kind of situation where there's a machine and inside the machine is something that's like making the machine do. All of the archer's motions are really precise and exact. It grasps every arrow between the thumb and the finger. It moves its head while it aims, and it shifts the bow when it releases the arrow. At this point, this little archer is more than 200 years old, and it still works. You can see videos of it online. Tanaka's other automata included sake cups, which behaved a lot like the tea-serving dolls that we talked about earlier. Another was Kobodaishi's secret ink brush. It depicted the Japanese Buddhist monk Kobo Daishi, who was known as Kukai during his life in the late 8th and early 9th centuries. The figure of Kobo Daishi uses a brush to draw a character in the air, and the character that he's drawing simultaneously appears on a separate Japanese sliding door. Tanaka often left some of the automata's inner workings visible, so observers could get a hint of all the complex gears and pulleys and other systems inside. By the age of 24, Tanaka Hisashige was considered to be a master at making these automata. He was nicknamed Karakuri Gaimon. Gaimon was another version of the name Hisashige. And he was hoping to make his living by creating uh, these automata and then also entertaining people with them. This was a career that combined being an engineer, an inventor, a craftsman, and an entertainer all into one. He was so eager to do it and so clearly skilled at it that he convinced his father to let one of his younger brothers take his place in the family business. And then Tanaka started touring Japan with his automata. There's some debate about whether the techniques and innovations that were used in Karakuri influenced other Japanese technology and innovations. But when it comes to the people who made them, it's clear that some went on to make technological advances in other fields. One example, Tanaka Hisashige, who we will talk about more after a sponsor break. Tanaka Hisashige spent a few years touring Japan with his Karakuri Automata. He became famous in this process, but unfortunately this career did not last. As we noted at the top of the show, the Tokugawa period in Japan was known for its stability, but at the same time, it was something of a financial house of cards. The daimyo were required to keep one home in their province and another in Edo, and then to travel back and forth between them. Both households and the travel were expected to be expensive and opulent, the idea being that if the daimyo were spending all their money on all this lavish upkeep, they'd never have enough money to be able to raise an army and rise up against the shogunate. At the same time, because the Tokugawa period was also relatively peaceful, the samurai class had evolved from being warriors to being administrators and bureaucrats, with most of them living on small stipends that weren't really enough to get by. Many were impoverished and dissatisfied with the shogunate and the daimyo. These and other factors led Mizuno Tadakuni, who was an advisor to the shogun, to institute a series of reforms starting in 1830, during what was known as the Tempo era. They emphasized austerity and frugality in all areas of life. Many officials and bureaucrats lost their positions, and expensive styles of artwork, clothing, and entertainment were discouraged or outright outlawed. This included the Karakuri Automata that Tanaka Hisashige had been designing and making. Tanaka turned out to be one of the Edo period's last Karakuri masters, and many of the surviving pieces that still exist today are ones that he created. With his career as a Karakuri craftsman no longer possible, Tanaka moved to Osaka in 1834 and started focusing on more practical uses for his skills in invention and engineering. 
He developed a water pump that firefighters put to use. He also created a collapsible candle stand that became very popular among doctors who could fold it flat to carry with them when they visited their patients. He also drew on the technology of that Dutch air gun to improve on the oil lamps that were being used for illumination. These lamps generally used a type of oil that didn't move up the lamp's wick very easily, which meant that the light tended to be dim and kind of flickery. Tanaka used compressed air to force the oil through the wick, which made the lamp burn brighter, longer, and more reliably. This lamp was called the Mujinto, and Tanaka made them in different sizes and styles to suit different tastes and needs. And soon they were being used all over Osaka. However, those tempo reforms had not returned Japan to a state of prosperous plenty the way they were intended. A famine developed alongside the austerity measures and other reforms, and that famine spiked in 1836 and 1837. In Osaka, this led to food riots and an uprising against the local leadership. Tanaka Hisashige and his family fled, leaving behind a workshop that was burned to the ground in the uprising. They moved to the Fushimi district of Kyoto. In Kyoto, Tanaka opened a shop where he made and sold candle stands and Mujinto lamps. He branched into new areas of study, including mathematics and astronomy. He also became interested in Western-style clocks that were being imported to Japan from Europe. He started making clocks on his own, including one that used a taiko drum as an alarm. He also got back to making devices that were not strictly practical, This time, they were incredibly intricate timepieces. One was called the Shumisengi, which he finished in 1850. This was requested by a Buddhist monk named Fumon Ensu, and it represented the universe as explained through Buddhist cosmology rather than through Western astronomy. The Earth is at the center, with the sun and the moon orbiting Mount Sumeru. It also indicated the 24 seasons of the year in the Buddhist calendar. This was a tabletop device that was wound up with a key, and sometimes it's described as Japan's first planetarium. His most famous creation during this time was the Mannen Jimeisho chronometer, or the myriad year clock, sometimes called the million year clock. He started on it in 1848, and he finished it in 1851. This clock measures about 63 centimeters, or 24 inches high, and it weighs 38 kilograms. It's about 83 pounds. In the words of Yulia Frumer, author of Making Time, Astronomical Time Measurement in Tokugawa, Japan, quote, while constructing the ultimate clock, Hisashige aspired to a perfection and beauty that were not only technical, but also aesthetic and material. This timepiece is intricate and it's also beautiful with an ornate surface that's covered in tiny mother-of-pearl inlays that are patterned in a style that's known as Raiden. There are also painted enamel inlays around the base, depicting things like a tortoise, a rooster, a drum, and a rabbit. This device has approximately a thousand pieces in its internal working parts. This clock has six faces, each with a unique purpose. The first is a wadoke, or a traditional Japanese clock that was used during the Edo period. In Western timekeeping, everything is a fixed length. There are 24 hours a day, 60 minutes an hour, 60 seconds in a minute, and the lengths of those increments do not change. But in traditional Japanese timekeeping, the length of an hour varies by the season. Each day is divided in half, with one half being daylight hours and the other being darkness. During the summer, when the days are longer, the daylight hours are longer and the nighttime hours are shorter. During the summer, when the nights are longer, it is, of course, the opposite. This sounds, to me, both beautiful and hard to keep up with. (laughs) Just because we didn't grow up with it. If it were your normal thing, you'd be like, yeah, now is the time when the hours are longer. What are you talking about? (laughs) You'd be like, why are all hours the same number of length all the time? Uh, So clockmakers in Japan made clocks that told time this way for about 200 years. They used a variety of methods to count for these seasonal variations. For example, they might have interchangeable faces or pulleys that people adjusted as the seasons changed. In the myriad year clock, the hours were represented by 12 moving silver pieces, six for the day and six for the night with the clock's inner workings adjusting the widths between them over time. So during the summer, the pieces on the top half of the clock face would slide farther apart to account for the longer hours, 
while the pieces on the bottom half would slide together, and then in the fall, that would reverse. The myriad year clock's second phase shows the 24 traditional seasons in a Japanese year, which were originally taken from the Chinese calendar. This calendar starts in the early spring, and it includes the spring and fall equinox, as well as the summer and winter solstice. But it also contains other seasons in between those markers, like rainwater, which is between the beginning of spring and the spring equinox, as well as lesser heat and greater heat, which are between the summer solstice and the beginning of autumn. The third face shows the days of the week and the hours of the day, and the fourth shows the date using the Chinese sexagenary or 60-year cycle. The fifth displays the lunar month and the phases of the moon, and the sixth includes a Western-style pocket watch, probably of French or Swiss origin, which shows the hours, minutes, and seconds according to Western timekeeping. This pocket watch also acts as a regulator for the rest of the clock. In addition to those six faces, the top of the clock, as seen from above, also shows a map of the Japanese archipelago with a model of the sun and moon on arms above it, showing the position of the sun and the moon in relation to the Earth. There are four main springs inside this clock, connected to one another with chains to keep them in sync with each other. Each spring is housed in a barrel that's small enough to fit in the palm of a person's hand. And when fully wound, the clock is meant to run for a year. When Tanaka made this clock, he hoped to sell it, but it was so complex and expensive that he could not find a buyer. So he toured with it, as he had done with his Karakuri automata earlier in his career. Today, the clock is designated as an important cultural property in Japan. We're going to come back to it later. When Tanaka finished the myriad-year clock in 1851, Japan was about to go through massive changes that affected virtually every area of life, including timekeeping, And we will get to that after a sponsor break. Between 1633 and 1853, Japan was relatively but not completely isolated from the rest of the world. As we noted earlier in the show, even after Japan closed its borders in the 1630s, it had continued to trade with the Chinese and the Dutch at the port of Nagasaki in southwestern Japan, People in and around Nagasaki personally witnessed the new and changing technologies that were making their way to and through the port. The Saga domain was responsible for Nagasaki's security and defense. Now Masa Nabeshima, who was the domain's daimyo, established a physics and chemistry research institute in 1852. He invited some of Japan's foremost inventors and engineers to the institute, and one of them was Tanaka Hisashige. Another was Sano Tsunetame, founder of the Japanese Red Cross Society. Then, on July 8, 1853, American Commodore Matthew Perry arrived in Edo Bay, now Tokyo Bay, to try to force Japan to start trading with the West, particularly with the United States. The U.S. had been unsuccessfully trying to establish trade with Japan for about 20 years at this point, and this time, Perry arrived with four ships from the U.S. Navy as a show of force. Japan knew it had no way to defend itself from the steamships and their armaments. It had seen a similar situation play out in China during the first Opium War just a decade before, which pitted British forces with steam-powered warships against Chinese vessels that were powered by sail. China's defeat had been disastrous, so reluctantly, Japan began negotiating with the United States. After months of negotiation, the U.S. and Japan signed the Treaty of Kanagawa on March 31, 1854. This treaty established a U.S. consulate in Japan and gave American ships the right to buy supplies like coal and water in two Japanese ports, It also provided protection for American sailors who were shipwrecked in Japanese waters. This treaty heavily favored the United States and its interests. The only thing Japan really got out of it was not being attacked by Perry's warships. The Treaty of Kanagawa didn't open Japan up to commercial trade with the U.S. That was still a few years off. But Perry had presented the emperor with several gifts, including working models of several technologies. That included a steam locomotive and a telegraph. Perry's arrival in Japan and these models had a huge impact on Tanaka's work at the Institute. His earlier work had mostly been focused on technologies that an individual person might use at home. But now he and others started looking at technologies that a whole community might use, like a railroad or a telegraph system. 
He became part of the team that built Japan's first working model of a steam locomotive, and in 1865, he helped build Japan's first steamship. As we noted earlier, Japan's social and economic structure had already been struggling before Perry arrived, and attempted reforms had often made the situation worse instead of better. In 1868, two clans combined forces to stage a coup d'etat, which took place on January 3rd of that year. They overthrew the Tokugawa shogun and restored Emperor Meiji, who was 14 at the time, to power. Massive changes followed to virtually every aspect of Japanese life. The feudal system and the samurai class were abolished, as were the daimyo's personal armies. The nation industrialized very rapidly. Even that Japanese system of timekeeping that we talked about with the myriad year clock was replaced with the Western-style 24-hour day. Basically, the emperor and his advisors recognized that Japan was under serious threat from Western powers, and they believed that their best chance at retaining their independence was to make the nation of Japan more compatible with the Western world. This is often described as a process of westernization and modernization, but some sources really give it a slightly different nuance, that Japan as a nation was trying to find a more western-oriented way of being Japanese. This mindset affected Tanaka Hisashige's work as well. As noted in a piece from the Seiko Museum, he wanted, quote, to accept advanced Western technologies and integrate them with Japanese culture in ways useful for society. During this time, Tanaka did some work on military technology, and eventually he moved back to his home province of Kurumi to take over a factory. He kept on inventing things while there, including an artificial ice-making machine. In 1873, when he was 73 years old, the Department of Industry appointed Tanaka to develop Japan's telegraph system. He moved to Tokyo at the government's request to do this work, Two years later, on July 11th, 1875, he founded Tanaka Seizo Sho, or Tanaka Engineering Company. Tanaka Hisashige died in Tokyo on November 7th, 1881. He had continued to create, invent, and refine until the end of his life. His adopted son took over Tanaka Engineering Company, which, after a series of name changes and mergers, became Tokyo Shibura Denki, or Toshiba, in 1939. Today, Tanaka Hisashige is seen as one of the founders of Japan's technology industry. The myriad year clock stopped working sometime after Tanaka's death. Then in 2004, it was totally disassembled to make a replica for the Expo 2005 World's Fair. The National Museum of Nature and Science and Toshiba Corporation were both part of this project, which was intended to analyze Edo period innovations and figure out their engineering. 100 specialists worked with the Myriad Year Clock for an entire year, including the Seiko Watch Corporation calling one of their retired watchmakers in for help. Just taking the clock apart and figuring out what all the components did took five months. And the team discovered that two of the clock's original springs had warped and cracked, which was probably what caused it to stop running. Putting the clock back together was also an enormous undertaking. And in terms of the replica... Microscopic analysis of the original showed that every single piece was handmade, including individually filing every tooth of every gear. Some of these handmade pieces just could not be perfectly replicated. Today, Toshiba Corporation owns the original Myriad Year Clock, but it is on permanent display at the National Museum of Nature and Science in Tokyo. The replica is at the Toshiba Science Museum in Kawasaki. Also... The October 16th, 2012 Google Doodle honored Tanaka Hisashige's 213th birthday. It depicts a Karakuri figure that uses calligraphy-like strokes to make a G to complete the name Google. This is one of those people whose minds I so admire and feel like yeah, um, uh, just a complete dum-dum who can't do anything <laughs> when I think about all that they're able to conceive of and process. Uh, yeah. Do you have listener mail for us? Uh, I do. This is from Tia, and the subject line of the email is, in all capital letters, the green beans, followed by four exclamation points. Uh, And Tia says, Dear Holly Tracy and Stuff You Missed staff, yes, I resonated on a deep level with Tracy's experience of home canned green beans. I spent a week with my parents this summer helping pick, snap, and can green beans in order to share the bounty because they are just that amazing 
I, too, find fresh green beans yucky to my palate. They squeak. Yeah, my parents still freeze and can a host of fruits and veggies from their gardens or from local farms. I appreciated learning about the origins of canning. I was surprised to learn it was so recent in the grand scheme. Thank you for all the work you do. I've been listening for several years now and so appreciate the breadth of scope you ladies cover. Two other recent ones I especially appreciate. It made me so happy to hear the story of the goat statue and ensuring arson attempts and successes corroborated. I used to work as an occupational therapist with high schoolers, and yes, in this day and age, I had handwriting goals for teenagers. Don't get me started on how irrelevant that was. I tried to find things that would interest students rather than having them copy boring sentences, and that vignette got some fun reactions. I especially appreciated the history of the Bureau of Home Economics episode as well. I'm now working as a homemaker, and I was fascinated to realize that there was an entire organization to help make guidelines and recommendations for the science of homemaking. I had a question I didn't submit in time for your question and answer so, but I'm still curious to know, what was your personal aha moment when you realized or began to realize that not everyone shares the same privilege as yourself? I hope I worded that well. I know it's a difficult question in a difficult time. One of you, Holly or Tracy, I don't remember which, shared in conjunction with the James Baldwin episode that you heard his speech about the Pledge of Allegiance as a child, and that was the start of your aha moment. For me, unfortunately, that aha moment didn't come until college when I had a person of color as a gospel choir director. He would share stories about his life, and the light bulb started to click that my white middle-class life had been very sheltered and very privileged. I'm still learning and growing, as are we all, and I appreciate how you both highlight those people and groups in history that are so often overlooked. Thank you for all you do. It is so appreciated, Tia. Thank you, Tia, for this note. That was Holly who talked about the aha moment while listening to James Baldwin. Since I grew up in, uh, like, northwest North Carolina, in an area that had, a like, a sizable population like a sizable white population, a sizable black population, and then sli- sort of like slightly outside of where we were directly living, a sizable Hispanic population. Um, like my mom had to talk to me about racism from an early age. So I think the first conversation I remember having specifically about racism, I was in elementary school, maybe as young as kindergarten. Basically, someone said a joke at school, and I repeated that joke to my mom. And um, this was, like, a very child logic kind of joke, but also racist. And my mom, in, like, the most age-appropriate way I can think of, explained to me that that joke would be hurtful to some of my friends. And it was sort of, it was obvious to me from an early age, like, like that not everybody had the same advantages. Um, In terms of an aha moment of the way, one of the ways that racism works in society was actually working on this podcast um, after the Trayvon Martin case, uh, after his murder. um, I had put an article on our Facebook page um, that was by a woman historian that I thought was relevant, and a whole lot of people came to leave implicitly racist comments that they did not comprehend were racist when they said them. And it was the first time that I had seen, like, that level of vitriol about something from people who had previously seemed rational (laughs) fans of the podcast. Um, And I was totally unprepared for how to deal with it. It was, like, one of the worst days of managing our social media presence. And it was not long at all after we started working on the show and so I think that that was sort of a, a different kind of aha moment than uh, when I was a kid. Yeah, I mean, I feel like even though I had that thing, that reaction, listening to James Baldwin when I was a child, like, it was probably foundational, but it wasn't like I carried that daily and was like, I need to be thinking about this. I also did a lot of stupid stuff and said incredibly hurtful and ignorant things along the way. And I feel like I still have aha moments all the time. Oh, yeah. And there was the one that I think about from the show was when we had Jerry Hancock on talking about Sears Mm -hmm. and him mentioning that the reason that Sears was so popular from the beginning with Black customers was because it was one of the first places they could shop, i.e. through a catalog, and not be discriminated against. And it was just like, 
oh, I never thought about it. And the fact that I never had to think about that was like, because you never had to. Right, Um, right. We have those all the time. Yeah, I definitely still have aha moments and still learn things that I had never considered before and still have moments where something comes out of my mouth and then I kind of go, Tracy. Right? (laughs) Did you just, (laughs) is that what you just said? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. it's hard. And it is, it's it's um, a lifelong process. It is. And I feel like a jerk so often and I'm always trying to be better and examine things. But even so, there are times when I'm like, I don't know if I just screwed up or not. Um, I remember having a moment, and thankfully one of our colleagues, who is a Black woman, is very patient with me, and she and I are close. And I had seen a woman that I did not know in the hallway of our office who had this, she's uh, dark skin, and she had on this very beautiful light blue blouse. And I just said that color looks spectacular on your skin. And she was like, oh, thank you. And she was very sweet. But then as I walked away from her, I was like, was that just inappropriate? And so, yeah. <laughs> so then I had this conversation with our colleague and with some of my other friends of color, um, Black and otherwise, and and kind of got their take on it. And thankfully, like, it is not their job to educate me, but because they have always been very kind and we have a close enough relationship that I can go, can I ask you this question? You can tell me no. Um, Luckily, I got my gut check. The consensus on that was no. (laughs) But I still think about it and I'm like, I hope she didn't, you know, perceive it. And that's, that's part of being privileged is that, like, you can say things that you may you might mean well. That's always the phrase. Like, well, they meant right, well. Right. You might genuinely mean well and still hurt someone. And I think that's where people get really caught up and defensive. Is like, but my intention was yeah. But that doesn't matter if somebody still gets hurt in the end. Yeah. That's kind of the lifelong aha of this show for me. Yeah. Yeah. It will be a lifelong for all of time. I think. Uh, so, Tia, thank you so much for this email. Um, if you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast, iHeartRadio.com, and we're all over social media at Missed in History. That is where you'll find our Facebook and Pinterest and Twitter and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app and Apple Podcasts and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 